Holy Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13, beginning at verse 24. Praise and glory to God. This is Jesus speaking uh, at the, the end of his uh, reply to the disciples, uh, asking about the end times. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable on your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, here we are in a new church year on um, Advent Sunday. You'll remember that the word Advent means coming. Advent's the season when we focus our attention on the promise of Jesus that he's coming again and remember his first coming at Christmas. And the teaching we've been hearing from Jesus in the, the lectionary readings over the last several weeks comes to a head in this passage. The disciples had asked him about the end and he told them about the destruction of the temple and events leading up to his own return. If you struggle with this, you're not alone. We all do. Much ink has been spread considering different interpretations of these words as people have tried to fit them to past and possible future events. And I don't pretend to have a clear, simple outline, nor can I tell you when Jesus will come again. And if I did say that, then you should reject what I said. Why? Because Jesus himself very clearly says here, and in the parallels of Matthew and Luke, and in, in Acts, that no one knows the time, that he didn't know the time, only the Father in heaven. I remember having a conversation with George Curl, who had in his time been a, a national director of Youth for Christ many years ago, and he wrote a book called The Times of the Signs, in which he placed the second coming, if I remember correctly, in 2005. And I protested to him that Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour. And he said, yes, but he didn't say you don't know the month or the year. <laughs> well, I think he got the wrong end of the stick there. He was wrong, obviously. And I think he wasn't recognized in the rhetorical style of Jesus' words. He means simply, only the Father knows when it will happen, and no one else knows when. Some of the events in Jesus' answer to the disciples have pretty surely already happened, particularly around the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, while others are still future. And scholars and preachers differ over which events to put into which category. But today I want to focus more on the hope that we have in the promise of the coming of Jesus. For hope is the key word 
of this first Sunday in Advent. Now, for a start, biblical hope is different from everyday use of that word. Our, our everyday usage in English is actually quite a lazy usage. It's, it's drifted from its original meaning. We use, in the same sort of way that awesome has very rapidly recently drifted away from its original meaning, we use it in a, a very casual sense of, I wish something, you know, I hope, I hope it will be fine tomorrow. It's just a wish, it may, may be fine, it may not be fine, who knows, it's, it's just desirable. But biblical hope is quite different, it's sure expectation. The thing hoped for is good, hope is positive, it's in the future, but you're sure that it will happen in the future. There, there's an expression that I used to puzzle over, to hope against hope. And once I realised that you could say expect, that hope is expectancy, then that makes more sense, it's to expect against expectations. It's used in Romans chapter 4 verse 18 when Paul is talking about Abraham, who had a promise from God that he'd have many, many descendants like the, like the sands of the, of the sea. But actually he's an old man and his wife is old and it's past childbearing years. And so he expected, because God gave him a promise, against natural expectations that this couldn't happen. So he hoped against hope. Now, it's a strong teaching through all the New Testament that Jesus will come again. And this is a hope. It's a positive thing, it's future, and it's sure. But it's not yet. Jesus is very clear in his Gospel passage, in this passage, that he will come again in glory and with power. And the purpose of his teaching is not to lay out a timeline for us to decode, but to encourage his followers through the years as tough times come, especially in persecution, that God knows the end from the beginning and that he is in charge. It may be tough, it may be very tough, but we need to hold on to the end and the good outcome. Paul refers to that in the epistle reading we heard. As you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed, he will keep you strong to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus, is faithful. The promise is repeated not once, but many times. Jesus will come again in glory and power, accompanied by angels to judge humanity. Now, we generally don't like the idea of judgment very much. We rather shy away from it. And yet, strangely, conversely in the Old Testament, they were quite keen on it. They tend to long for it and welcome it, as we heard in the Isaiah passage today. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. Come down and make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. And this seems rather odd. We have far more reason to be confident facing Christ in judgment as those who have been saved and redeemed and justified and sanctified. If we've put our faith in Jesus as Lord and Saviour, we've already passed through judgment. We've been found guilty and redeemed. We've admitted our guilt. Jesus has atoned for it so that we will not be judged for our sins in the last judgment. There will be a judgment we face, but it's a judgment of rewards, not of salvation. Salvation is already settled. The judgment we would face if we're a believer in Jesus, is how he will reward us for our service to him and our, our following of him. It's a positive judgment, not condemnation. So we have the hope of seeing our Saviour in glory and power. We have the confidence of salvation because he died for us and rose again. And then there is the glorious future state of those who inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus will say, come, O blessed of my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We will enter a kingdom where no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him or worship him. This is not some airy-fairy non-physical state. Isaiah, Peter, James and John all wrote of the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation 21 tells of the new Jer Jer Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And in that future state, God will dwell with redeemed humanity. They will be his people. 
and he'll be with them. In the new creation, there will be a joining together of heaven and earth so that we might live in the presence of God. In the new creation, we have resurrection bodies, even as Jesus had a resurrection body when he rose from the dead. So Paul is emphatic about this in 1 Corinthians 15. The resurrection of Jesus is called the first fruit of the general resurrection. The term first fruit is used of a harvest, the very beginning of the harvest, the first ear of wheat, the first fruit on a fruit tree is the first fruit, which is the promise that more is to come. The harvest is starting. And the resurrection of Jesus is called the first fruit of the general resurrection. We wait for the great harvest which is yet to be brought in. We're told our resurrection bodies will not grow old or be sick or weary. There'll be no more death or mourning or pain. We shall see Jesus crowned with glory and honour. Now, we are not told all that we might like to know about that future state. We may have many questions, but we are told what's necessary for our salvation. There are various statements from which we can draw inferences. But we need to be humble in that process of inferring, because of course we can, we can misinterpret things by inference. When we communicate, just as any one human to another, we use words which have to relate to some common experience or idea or understanding. So if I say that is blue, you have to know what the colour blue is for that to make any sense. And if I was talking to a colourblind person, how would I convey the idea of blueness to them? I mean, how do you do it? There's no common experience. They, they don't know what I'm talking about. And I think that there's something of this difficulty with prophetic descriptions of things which are outside this realm. Where there's no common experience, it's very hard to describe the thing seen. And so the prophet has to resort to similes. It's saying it's like this, but it's different, it's greater. It's and we're left, well, how, how is it like this and like that? And I can't quite understand how those things happen. Without seeing the same thing, it's hard for us to imagine. But I think when we do see the fullness of what, in all the different prophecies, what the prophet has said, we'll say, oh, now I see what you mean. Yes, your description made sense, but it was outside my experience before. But nonetheless, we can... Here that Jesus spoke of our feasting with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He spoke at the last supper of not drinking wine again until he drank it in the kingdom. These things suggest there is, there is eating, there is feasting in that state. Music seems to feature strongly in descriptions in Revelation and in sung worship. Revelation describes a river running through the New Jerusalem with the tree of life bearing fruit on its banks. The streets of the city are described as paved in gold and yet like crystal. So I don't quite know how it can be looking like gold and crystal at the same time, but that's the sort of thing I mean. It's a, it's a simile of something which we haven't seen, and that's the best the prophet can do to explain it. Now these could be symbolic, but they're certainly intended as very positive and wonderful descriptions. If they're not physical realities in that state, they are still wonderful realities. And St. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. In other words, his plans and preparations for us are greater than anything that we can see or hear or imagine. It will be far greater, it will be far more glorious than the inklings that we have at the moment. The inheritors of the kingdom will be brought into a glorious existence on the new earth and God will dwell with them. And that is our hope. Now in the Gospel reading, reading, Jesus said we cannot predict the time of his return. He's also very clear that we must remain alert to what he's asked us to do and be ready for his return. In any organisation, there are responsibilities which need to be done so that the organisation can function as a whole. No employer wants to set staff to work, go away and come back and find they're not doing it. There's a story that St Francis of Assisi was cultivating a row of beans in the garden in his old age, when someone came past and said, 
what would you be doing now if you knew that today was the last day of your earthly life? And he said, I would keep on hurrying. In other words, he's doing what he ought to be doing. He doesn't need to change what he's doing because what he's doing is the right thing to be doing. And Jesus tells this parable at the end of this teaching of a householder going away, leaving his servants with responsibilities. They don't know when he may come back. But he tells them to be responsible while he's away. And Jesus, in his example, tells us to keep watch, and he names actually the four watches of the night, the standard watch periods in the night of that time, evening, midnight, cockcrow, and dawn. And he urges his followers, and then he says it more generally, I say to everyone, watch. So we're to be watching and doing the things he's asked us to do. The Bishop of Christchurch, Bishop Peter, writes a weekly um, digest of thoughts on the readings coming up. And he says, how might you live as you watch? And he gives the answer, we are to be faithful, repentant, and doing his business. And gives us three questions today, am I faithful to Jesus? Today, have I confessed and repented of all sin? Today, am I going about my master's business? May he grant us the grace to be watchful and ready. Amen.